Okay, Dracula, assignment number 14. Now, you learned at the end of 13 that Nina has had an extraordinarily bad day of it. Um, we now know that the Count, um, to be cruel to her, he didn't do it because he needs any more disciples. He did it to mess with her. But there's also another reason why he did it. And I don't want to give that away right now. But he forced Mina to drink his blood, which means he is turning her into a vampire. Now, <sighs> You know what? I don't want to give anything away as well. I'm just going to say that some vampire legends, let's see how it is in this, uh, believe that once you drink that vampire blood, you become kind of like a half pyre. But what makes you a full vampire is when you drink somebody else's blood, somebody who isn't a vampire. And the minute you do that, then you become a full-fledged 100% vampire. So right now, she's technically not, if this is the way it works in this legend, we have to wait and see. But right now, she's technically not a full vampire because she still hasn't drank an innocent person's blood yet. But she did drink Dracula's blood, so she's kind of halfway there. So I'm on the bottom of page 418. I'm going to pick it up. Again, uh, this is assignment number 14. You're going to read it from 418 to 451. That is, of course, if you're using the online text. If you're using any other text or listening to it, please just make sure you answer all the questions for assignment number 14. So here we go. She was good. She was so good and brave that we all felt that our hearts were strengthened to work and endure for her. And we began to discuss what we were to do. I told her that she was to have all the papers in the safe and all the papers or diaries and phonographs we might hereafter use and was to keep the record as she had done before. She was pleased with the prospect of anything to do if pleased could be used in connection with so grim an interest. As usual, Van Helsing had thought ahead of everyone else and was prepared with an exact ordering of our work. It is perhaps well, he said, that, that, that at our meeting after our visit to Carfax, we decided not to do anything with the earth boxes that lay there. Had we done so, the Count must have guessed our purpose and would doubtless have taken measures in advance to frustrate such an effort with regard to the others. But now he does not know our intentions. Nay, more in all probability, he does not know that such a power exists to us and can sterilize his lairs so that he cannot use them as of old. We are now so much further advanced in our knowledge as to their disposition that when we have examined the house in Piccadilly, we may track the very last of them. Today, then, is ours, and in it rests our hope. The sun that rose on our sorrow this morning guards us in its course. Until it sets tonight, that monster must retain whatever form he now has. He is confined within the limitations of his earthly envelope. So that's an interesting thing we just learned, that Dracula cannot change his forms during daylight hours. So whatever form he is in, he is stuck in that form until it is darkness. So wherever he is and whatever coffin he is, he must remain there until it is dark and cannot change his form. He cannot melt into thin air, nor disappear through cracks or chinks or crannies. If he go through a doorway, he must open the door like a mortal. And so we have this day to hunt out all of his layers and sterilize them. So we shall, if we have not, if we not yet catch and destroy him, drive him to bay in some place where the catching and the destroying shall be in time sure. Here I started up for I could not contain myself. The thought that the minutes and seconds so precisely laden with Mina's life and happiness were flying from us, since whilst we talked, action was impossible. But Van Helsing held up his hand warningly. Nay, friend Jonathan, he said, in this, the quickest way home is the longest way. So your proverbs say, we shall all act and act with desperate quick when the time has come. But think, in all probable, the key of the situation is in that house in Piccadilly. The Count may have many houses which he has bought. Of them, he will have deeds of purchase, keys and other things. He will have papers that he writes on. He will have his book of checks. There are many belongings that he must have somewhere. Why not in this place so central, so quiet, where he comes and goes by the front or the back at all hours, when in the va very vast of the traffic there is none to notice? We shall go there and search that house. And when we learn what it holds, then we do what our friend Arthur call in his phrases of hunt stops the earth. And so we run down our old fox. So is it not? So, I mean, think about this. Jonathan is over here freaking out because his woman, Mina, is now a half vampire. And he's worried about the time is ticking on her. And he says, we've got to get this vampire now. We've got to stop this vampire now. Also, by the way, so you know, another vampire legend, and we'll find out. I don't know if it's in this book or not, although I do. I'm just lying to you, is the idea that if you have a half pyre, the way you can stop them from becoming a full vampire, not only by not, I mean, not having them drink the blood of somebody else, does it make them a full vampire, but it doesn't take away their half pyre status. How do you take away their half pyre status? By killing the head vampire before the half pyre drinks somebody's blood. So Jonathan wants to get to Dracula and kill him because he knows that would save Mina. Then let us come at once, I cried. We are wasting the precious, precious time. 
The professor did not move, but simply said, and how are we to get into that house in Piccadilly? Anyway, I cried, we shall break in if need be. And your police, where will they be? And what will they say? It was staggered, but I knew that if he wished to delay, he had good reason for it. Actually, um, Van Helsing is being very smart. Jonathan is like, screw it, let's just go. Let's just break into the house and figure it out. And Van Helsing says, yeah, but if the cops come, what are we gonna tell them that we're breaking in to stop a vampire from killing people? They're gonna lock us up in the nut house. They're gonna put us into the lunatic asylum that Dr. Seward here works at. So he's actually using his head, right? He's, he's looking at this in a common sense way because again, he doesn't have, his lover isn't in jeopardy the way Jonathan's is. I was staggered, but I knew that if he wished to delay, he had a good reason for it. So I said as quietly as I could, don't wait more than need be. You know, I am sure what torture I am in. Oh, my child, that I do. And indeed, there is no wish of me to add to your anguish. But just think, what can we do until all the world be at movement? Then will come our time. I have thought and thought, and it seems to me that the simplest way is the best of all. Now we wish to get into that house, but we have no key. Is it not so? I nodded. Now suppose that you were in truth the owner of that house and still could not get in and think there was to you no conscience of the housebreaker. What would you do? I should get a respectable locksmith and set him to work to pick that lock for me. And your police? They would interfere, would they not? Oh, no, not if they knew the man was properly employed. Then he looked at me as keenly as he spoke. All that is in doubt is the conscience of the employer and the belief of your policeman as to whether or not that employer has a good conscience or a bad one. Your police must indeed be zealous men and clever. Oh, so clever in reading the heart that they trouble themselves in such matters. No, no, my friend, Jonathan, you go take the lock off a hundred empty houses in this year London or of any city in the world. And if you do it as such things are rightly done and at the times things things are rightly done, no one will interfere. Actually, Dan Helsing's pretty smart. He says, well, if we go hire a locksmith in the middle of the day and we explain to that locksmith that we've locked ourselves out of our own home, he'll come open the door. And if the police come over and ask us, the locksmith will say, well, I'm just opening these gentlemen's home for them because it's very rare that a criminal would hire a locksmith to come and break into a house. I've read of a gentleman who owned so fine a house in London, and when he went for months of summer to Switzerland and lock up his house, some burglar come and broke a window at it back and got in. Then he went and made open the shutters in front and walked in and out through the front door before the very eyes of the police. Then he had an auction in that house and advertised it and put up big notice. And when the day, the day came, he sell off by a great auctioneer all the goods of that other man who owned them. Then he go to a builder and he sell him that house make an agreement that he pull it down and take away all within a certain time. And your police and other authority help him all they can. And when that owner come back from his holiday in Switzerland, he finds only an empty hole where his house had been. This was all done en regal. And in our work, we shall be en regal too. We shall not go so early that the policemen who have been little to think of shall deem it strange. But we shall go after 10 o'clock when there are many about. And such things would be done when we indeed owners of the house. I could not see but how right he was, and the terrible despair of Mina's face became relaxed in thought. There was hope in such good counsel. Then Helsin went on. When once within the house, we may find more clues. At any rate, some of us can remain there whilst the rest find the other places where there be more earth boxes at Bernmondsdy and Mile End. Lord Gilgamesh stood up. I can be of some use here, he said. I shall wire to my people to have horses and carriages where they shall be the most convenient. Look here, old fellow, said Morris. It is a capital idea to have already in case we want to go horsebacking. But don't you think that one of your snappy carriages with its heraldic adornments in a byway of Walworth or Mile End would attract too much attention for our purposes? It seems to me that we ought to take cabs when we go south or east and even leave them somewhere near the neighborhood we are going to. Friend Quinty is right, said the professor. His head is what you call in a plane with the horizon. It is a difficult thing that we go to do, and we do not want no people to watch us, if so it may. Mina took a growing interest in everything, and I was rejoiced to see the exigency of affairs was helping her to forget for a time the terrible experiences of the night. She was very, very pale, almost ghastly, and so thin that her lips were drawn away, showing her teeth in somewhat of prominence. I did not mention this last, lest it should give her needless pain, but it made my blood run cold in my veins to think of what occurred with poor Lucy when the Count had sucked her blood. Did you see her, her teeth are showing more of prominence? It's like her fangs are getting ready to become a vampire. As yet, there was no sign of the teeth growing sharper, but the time as yet was short, and there was time to fear. I mean, she just drank the blood last night and already her teeth are start, starting to seem a little longer. What happens tomorrow and the next day? Is she gonna be able to stop herself from attacking one of these men and taking their blood? 
when we came to the discussion of the sequence of our efforts and of the disposition of our forces, there were new sources of doubt. It was finally agreed that before starting from Piccadilly, we should destroy the Count's lair close at hand. In case he should find it out too soon, we should thus be still ahead of him in our work of destruction, and his presence in his purely material shape and at his weakest might give us some new clue. As to the disposal of forces, it was suggested by the professor that, after our visit to Carfax, we should all enter the house in Piccadilly, that the two doctors and I should remain there whilst Lord Godalming and Quincy found the lairs at Walworth and Mile End and destroyed them. It was possible, if not likely, the professor urged, that the Count might appear in Piccadilly during the day, and if that if that's so, we might be able to cope with them then and there. And that would be easy, right? He says, while we're chilling at Piccadilly, maybe the Count shows up, and then we just stake him and it's all done. I don't think, ladies and gentlemen, it's going to work out that easily. And I also, this is just me speaking here, I don't think the count is as dumb as they think. I mean, the guy's been alive for hundreds and hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of years. At any rate, although you might want to say that because he's been alive so long, maybe his confidence has gotten so strong that he thinks that he can outsmart all human beings. Um, you know, just, just these, these things that I eat every once in a while, they're not that smart. So maybe his guard is down. Hmm, let's see. At any rate, we might be able to follow him in force. To this plan, I strenuously objected. And so far as my going was concerned, for I said that I intended to stay and protect Mina. I thought that my mind was made up on that subject, but Mina would not listen to my objection. She said that there might be some law matter in which I could be useful. That amongst the Count's papers might be some clue which I could understand out of my experience in Transylvania. She's actually right. She's like, dude, you need to go to Piccadilly and you need to read all those papers because you know the Count more than anybody else. And you're also a lawyer, so you might understand something in those papers that somebody else might not. And that as it was, all the strength we could muster was required to cope with the Count's extraordinary power. Oh, and there's that as well. If he does show up, you're going to want a more men to be there because remember, he has super strength. Although during the day, it won't be that strong. I had to give in for Mina's resolution was fixed. She said that it was the last hope for her that we should all work together. As for me, she said, I have no fear. Things have been as bad as they can be and whatever may happen must have in it in some element of hope or comfort. Go, my husband, God can, if he wishes it, guard me as well alone as with anyone present. So I started up crying out that in God's name, let us come at once, we are losing time. The count may come to Piccadilly earlier than we think. Not so, said Van Helsing, holding up his hand. But why, I asked. Do you forget, he said, with actually a smile, that last night he banqueted heavily and will sleep late? <laughs> Did I forget? Shall I ever? Can I ever? He's like, dude, you think I'm going to forget? He banqueted on my wife. He drank her blood. But the, the, he does have a good point. He's saying that when the, when the count and when anybody, when they have such a big meal, they oftentimes rest longer afterwards. Did I forget? Shall I ever? Can I ever? Can any of us ever forget that terrible scene? Mina struggled hard to keep her brave countenance, but the pain overmastered her and she put her hands before her face and shudders while she moaned. Van Helsing had not intended to crawl, recall her frightening experience. He had simply lost sight of her and her part in the affair in his intellectual effort. When it struck him what he said, he was horrified at his thoughtlessness and tried to comfort her. Oh, Madam Mina, he said, dear, dear Madam Mina, alas, that I of all who so reverence you should have said anything so forgetful. These stupid old lips of mine and this stupid old head do not deserve so but you will forget it, will you not? He bent low and beside her as he spoke. She took his hand and looked at him through her tears and hoarsely, no, I shall not forget, for it is well that I remember. And with it, I have so much memory of you that it is sweet that I take it all together. Now, you must all go being, so you must all be going soon. Breakfast is ready and we must all eat that we may be strong. Breakfast was a strange meal to us all. We tried to be cheerful and encourage each other and Mina was the brightest and most cheerful of us. When it was over, Van Helsing stood up and said, now, my dear friends, we go forth to our terrible enterprise. Are we all armed as we were on that night when first we visited our enemy's lair? Armed against ghostly as well as carnal attack? Now, again, there's two different ways you can be armed, right? You can have guns and knives, which you could take, you know, which you would use against carnal attack, which is any, you know, people or animals that come after you. But again, he also means ghostly weapons, which would be weapons you would use against the vampire. Things like, you know, your crosses, your holy water, stuff like that. We all assured him that it is well. Now, Mina, Madam Mina, you are in my, any case quite safe here until the sunset. And before then we shall return if, 
We shall return. But before we go, let me see you armed against personal attack. I have myself, since you came down, prepared your chamber by the placing of things of which we know, so that he may not enter. So I guess what he's saying is he has put garlic and everything all around her window so he can't come in. Now let me guard yourself. On your forehead, I touch this piece of sacred wafer in the name of the Father, the Son, and... Okay, so he actually takes a piece of um, Eucharist, what they give in church, you know, um, the body and blood of Christ. This is the body of Christ, the little wafer when you have communion, and he touches that to Mina's forehead. Now remember, vampires and even half-pires, they do not tolerate things from the church. Listen to what Mina does. There was a fearful scream which almost froze our hearts to hear. As he had placed a wafer on Mina's forehead, it had seared it, had burned into the flesh as though it had been a piece of white-hot metal. My poor darling's brain had told her the significance of the fact as quickly as her nerve received the pain of it, and the truth so overwhelmed her that her overwrought nature had its voice in that dreadful scream. So he touched the wafer to her head, and it literally melts into her flesh, and she screams out in agony. But the words to her thought came quickly. The echo of the scream had not ceased to ring on the air when there came the reaction, and she sank on her knees on the floor in an agony of abasement. So first she feels the pain, but what bothers her even more than the pain is the fact that she now knows, and there's no more hiding it, that she is losing her soul. Because when they touched that piece of God, that godly, you know, that religious item, that wafer to her forehead, it burned into her flesh. And she sank on her knees on the floor in an agony of abasement, pulling her beautiful hair over her face as the leper of his old mantle. She wailed out, unclean, unclean. Even the Almighty shuns my polluted flesh. I must bear this mark of shame upon my forehead until the judgment day. They all paused. And that's true. So he does, he rips the, the wafer off her head, but she has this like, it's like burned into her forehead for the rest of her life. So if she becomes a vampire, she's going to be a vampire walking around with this burn in her face, in her head. If she becomes, you know, if she doesn't become a vampire, if they're able to kill the, the count and she's able to go back to being human again, she's still going to have that burn on her for the rest of her life. They all paused. I had thrown myself behind her in an agony of helpless grief and putting my arms around her held her tight. For a few minutes, our sorrowful hearts beat together whilst the friends around us turned away their eyes that ran tears silently. Then Van Helsing turned and said gravely, so gravely that I could not help feeling that he was in some way inspired and was sitting, stating things out himself. It may be that you may have to bear that mark till God himself see fit as he most surely shall on the judgment day to redress all wrongs of the earth and of his children that he hath placed thereon. And oh, Madam Mina, my dear, my dear, may we who love you be there to see when that red scar, the signs of God's knowledge of what has been shall pass away and leave your forehead as pure as the heart we know. And he comes in and says, no, don't worry, Mina. You may have to live with this for the rest of your life, but when you die and you go before God, he will see it and know that you stopped this from happening. In fact, that you were awesome, that because of you, that Dracula dude was killed if he's killed, of course, and you actually have something to be proud of. You did something great in your life. For so surely as we live, that sharp scar shall pass away when God sees right to lift the burden that is hard upon us. Till then we bear our cross as his son did in obedience to his will. It may be that we are chosen instruments of his good pleasure and that we ascend to his bidding as that other through stripes and shame, through tears and blood, through doubts and fear and all that makes the difference between God and man. There was hope in his words and comfort. And they made for resignation. Mina and I both felt so. And simultaneously, we, took, took, we each took one of the old man's hands and bent over and kissed it. And without a word, we all knelt down together and all holding hands, swore true to be true to each other. We men pledged ourselves to raise the veil of sorrow from the heart of our home, each in his own way we loved. And we prayed for help and guidance in this terrible task which lay before us. It was then time to start. So I said farewell to Mina, a parting which neither of us shall forget to our dying day. And we set out. All right. So they all make a pledge and they say, we're going to stick this out until the very end. To one thing I've made up my mind. If we find out that Mina must be a vampire in the end, then we shall not go into the unknown and terrible land of Loan. So I suppose it is thus that in old times one vampire meant many. Just as their hideous bodies could only rest in sacred earth, so the holiest love was the recruiting sergeant for their ghastly ranks. All right, what did he just say there? To one thing I have made up my mind, if we find out that Mina must be a vampire, then she shall not go into the unknown and terrible land alone. Oh, snap. Do you know what he just said? If it doesn't work and Mina becomes a vampire, then I'm going to become one too. 
so that she is not alone in her hell. Not for nothing. This man is ready to give up his very soul so that his wife would not be alone and soulless by herself. That's really awesome of him. It's kind of stupid, but it's awesome. And then look at the last thing he says. I suppose it is thus that in old times, one vampire meant many. So I guess what he's saying is in the old days, a lot of people made this choice. When they knew it was their husband or wife as the vampire or their son or daughter, rather than kill them because they couldn't do that, they themselves let themselves be turned so that they would be a vampire with them, which meant more vampires would happen. So the holiest love was the recruiting sergeant for the ghastly rank. So he's saying it was people's love that kept them from not killing them or kept them from or, or had them become a vampire themselves to join them. This is getting kind of crazy. Are they going to stop Dracula in, in time? Is Nina going to become a vampire before that happens? Is she going to lose her control and, and be forced to drink or eat somebody's blood and then become a full vampire herself? Is she going to eat her own husband who just said he would let her if there was no other choice? He wouldn't kill her first. I don't know about you guys, but if I found my wife had become a soulless vampire, I'm staking her. I'm staking her and um, whether or not, and I know that she, I would never see her in heaven and her soul is gone forever. But I believe in my heart that she would rather me do that because if I didn't stake her, then that would mean that she would go around and would do that to more and more people and would ruin more and more people's souls. And I believe, I know that my wife wouldn't want that to happen. And I can tell you same thing for me. If, if I was turned, I would want my wife or child or any of you or any of my friends to stake me as well. I understand that my soul is gone for eternity, but I don't want to take other people's souls down with me. I don't want to ruin other people's eternities as well. It's a tough choice, but that's just how I stand. Jonathan says he couldn't do it, but that's what he's saying before it becomes time. Sometimes you say one thing and then when it actually happens, you find that you can't do what you said or you don't want to do what you said. So we have to wait until the situation arises and then see what we're actually going to do. All right, I'm going to shut up now. I read until the bottom of page 427. Your job for assignment number 14 is to read from 428 to 451. So you only have about 14, 15 pages left. Shouldn't take, excuse me, shouldn't take you too long. And we're going to find out what happens when these gentlemen get to these houses. Do they find the paperwork and the stuff? Do they find the count himself? Have a great day. I'll see you tomorrow.